Keith, I'm testing the audio for Keith. Keith and Mary Scott, can you hear me? Good afternoon. I'm Mandy Cohen, Secretary of the Health, uh, Department of Health and Human Services North Carolina, and with me on the stage is Director Sprayberry, Assistant Secretary Lockhart from the North Carolina Employment Security Commission, and Commissioner Todd Ishi from the Division of Adult, Adult Correction. Brian Tipton and Nicole Fox are our American Sign Language interpreters, and working behind the scenes are our Spanish interpreters, Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. I'll start with a rundown of numbers for today. As of this morning, we had 1,837 cases in 83 counties across North Carolina. Of these cases, about 9% are in people 18 to 24, 42% in ages 25 to 49, 27% in people ages 50 to 64, and 20% in people ages 65 and older. We have 184 hospitalizations currently, and we've had, sadly, 16 deaths here in North Carolina. We've completed more than 28,000 tests across the state from labs that have reported their negative tests to us, though not all do. And so I'm pleased to share that we have now more data integrated into our online COVID-19 dashboard. This includes available hospital beds, number of ventilators, information about our requests to the strategic national stockpile, and demographic information about cases and deaths in our state. We'll continue to add data. Today, today we added data on number of outbreaks in congregate settings. These are settings like nursing homes, adult care homes, and correctional facilities. Many of these settings are designed to serve groups of the very highest risk folks for the illness in COVID-19, older adults with chronic underlying medical conditions. A new study that was just published a few days ago shows that containing an outbreak in a long-term care facility can be exceptionally challenging. Therefore, it's very important to prevent the introduction of the virus in the first place in those settings. We are working very closely with our partners, with industry associations, our local health departments, and the facilities on their planning and preparation. We need to be incredibly vigilant in these long-term care settings. Frankly, we all need to be vigilant. We know that there's a lot more to be learning about the virus, but as we learn more every day, it only reinforces Governor Cooper's action that he took this week to make sure that we are all staying home to stop the spread of this virus. Not only is COVID-19 highly contagious, we're learning that there may be many people who have the virus and don't have symptoms, but can still spread the infection to others. That's why we need to each do our part. We're in this together. Our fates are intertwined, perhaps more in more ways that we did not originally recognize. That's also what keeps me strong and, and hopeful. When I see people buying groceries for their neighbors, or teachers leading car parades through their students' neighborhoods, or strangers setting, sending pizzas to doctors and nurses in a nearby hospital, I know that North Carolinians are doing what they always do, pulling together and taking care of one another. The one thing that we can all do together is stay home. It's how in this moment we can best serve one another, serve our communities, serve our state, stay home, and save lives. With that, I'm going to turn over to Director Sprayberry. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Good afternoon, everyone. 
Today is day 24 of the State Emergency Operations Center activation for the COVID-19 response. 61 counties have their local emergency operations centers activated. 99 counties in the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians have declared local states of emergency. Yesterday, we submitted a request to FEMA to activate a non-congregate sheltering program to provide thousands of rooms affected by of people affected by COVID-19. This program would provide individual rooms in places like hotels, dormitories, or other buildings for people who have been exposed or tested positive for COVID-19 but do not need hospitalization. Also for people who are symptomatic and awaiting test results and individuals who don't have symptoms but are at high risk of contracting the virus due to age, medical issues, or their precarious housing situation. Implementing this kind of temporary housing would help reduce the surge of people to our state's hospitals and help sick people get care that they need. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is helping with facility assessments to find locations that are suitable for non-congregate housing and for overflow hospital space. We've completed receiving and inventorying our third shipment from the Strategic National Stockpile. The final truck from that shipment arrived last night. With three shipments received from the stockpile, we've received these portions of the requested items. 48% of N95 mask, 119% of surgical and face mask, 23% of face shields, 18% of gowns, 92% of gloves, and we've not received any hair covers, shoe covers, or goggles that are part of the protective personal equipment. Our logistics and sourcing teams continue to find and buy additional personal protective equipment. Our orders so far have exceeded $100 million, but we've received very little of that. Call centers at the state and local levels, including 211 and 911, are still receiving many calls from people wanting to report where social distancing is not being observed. Please refrain from making these calls. We need to keep the 911 lines open for true emergencies. 211 is taking thousands of calls daily from people who need information or help with resources like food, utilities, child care, and other needs. <clears throat> for daily information updates on the coronavirus, you don't have to call. You can just text COVIDNC to 898-211. 898-211 to receive regular updates. More than 60,000 people are already receiving text. Remember to stay home and stay distanced to stop the spread. Thank you for your support of the State Emergency Response Team. The team's working hard for you every day. With your help, we will get through together. Remember to check on your family and friends frequently and let them know you love them. Special thanks to our county partners. We know you're working hard. One team, one mission, one family. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Director Sprayberry. Now let me turn it over to Assistant Secretary Lockhart-Taylor from the North Carolina Employment Security Commission. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, my name is Lockhart-Taylor and I am Assistant Secretary for the Division of Employment Security. Since this big, uh, crisis began, our online benefits system has taken more than 355,000 claims for unemployment benefits. To put that in perspective, that averages to almost 1,000 claims an hour for 24 hours a day for the last 14 days. So far this week, uh, we have paid $8.2 million dollars to those who have filed claims identifying COVID as the reason for separation. That number is going to increase exponentially in the coming days. Please know that once you apply, it will take up to two weeks before you will receive your first benefit payment. The mission of the employment security has always been to provide benefits to those who have lost their job through no fault of their own and during times of crisis, whether it's due to just the loss of job or during a natural disaster. We've been through emergencies and disasters before, and we understand that for the people who have lost their job, the help 
can't get there soon enough. We know that a lot of people have had problems accessing our system or getting through on the phones. This is not acceptable. We've taken immediate action in the, face, in the face of this historic challenge. We hear your frustration, and I know the importance these benefits will have during the times of uncertainty. And we are working around the clock to be there for the North Carolinians who need our help. We're bringing on 350 people to help individuals and businesses to respond to claims and to file claims. We will be adding more staff as quickly as possible. We're modifying our existing phone system to improve capacity and quality through a cloud platform. We've increased the capacity of our servers, made upgrades to improve the stability of our system for those who have had problems getting through or that the system has kicked you out of. Uh, we believe that this system is becoming more stable every day. We will continue to listen, monitor, and identify ways to better serve all the people who desperately need this help. I know this crisis is far from over, but we also know we couldn't wait for the perfect uh, solution to start applying, so we needed immediate action. On Saturday, the governor authorized the implementation of new federal unemployment programs. The first provides an additional $600 in weekly benefits. The second provides up to 13 additional weeks of benefits for those who have exhausted their claim. The third is called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, which is an assistance for individuals who are traditionally not eligible for state unemployment benefits, such as self-employed workers and independent contractors. I know people are anxious uh, to start getting their benefits. Right now, we are awaiting final guidance from the U.S. Department of Labor since we administer this program on behalf of the federal government so we can program our existing systems to make, the, make these benefits and the application process available to those in need. Uh, we are waiting on more guidance to, from the DOL uh, who will, will help us in determine who will be eligible for these benefits. We will provide you with details about the eligibility and how to apply as soon as we have that information. Please continue to monitor the DES website at des.nc.gov for the most up-to-date information. We understand how important it is for the people to get this assistance. I have committed staff dedicated to doing this as quickly and as effectively and efficiently as possible. We, like I said, we have, we've, we've handled crisis before, and I can't thank my staff enough for all that they are doing to assist you, and I promise you we will do it faster. I want to assure North Carolinians that we know uh, our job is just beginning. And we will not rest until, every, until we've processed every claim, answered every question, and every phone call. Thank you very much. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Taylor. And now I'm going to turn over to Commissioner Todd Ishi from the Division of Adult Correction. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, good afternoon. The safety and health of our employees and those incarcerated in our state prison system and ultimately the general public remains our top priority. As of this afternoon, I'm reporting four cases of COVID-19 within our prison system. All four were previously in isolation and are now continuing in medical isolation under physician's care. We've also had four employees of the Division of Prisons that have reported that they've been infected with COVID-19. We've prepared long and hard for this day. This was not a surprise to us and we are following CDC infectious disease protocols that we have in place and have been in place for a number of years exactly to address this type of situation. Our top priority is the health and safety of our staff and the men and women who are in our care. 
The department continues to monitor this constantly changing and evolving situation. Things are changing day by day and sometimes hour by hour. We are continuing to take additional safety steps to help preempt and reduce the opportunity for the virus to spread throughout the prison system. Prisons is actively engaged with the Governor's Coronavirus Disease Task Force. The Incident Command System is in place and we are working very closely with the Division of Emergency Management, the Department of Health and Human Services, and others in continually monitoring the health conditions of the offender population with specific focus on cleaning, good hygiene practices, medical triage, appropriate testing, and tracking. Some of the most recent actions that, that we've put in place uh, be, were on March 31st, uh, health screening of all st staff and visitors entering the prisons uh, to include temperature checks. Uh, the screening in, in includes screening, uh, checks for folks that have a temperature of over 100 degrees have symptoms of respiratory illness or been exposed in the past 14 days or have been in contact with someone who is suspected to have COVID-19. Initially, the screenings were rolled out at Central Prison, North Carolina Correctional Institution for Women, which are both here in Raleigh and at the Maury Correctional Institution in Greene County and the Piedmont Correctional Institution in Salisbury. As of April 1st, Screenings to include temperatures were implemented at all facilities division-wide. A 14-day quarantine period has been added for new admissions to the prison system, in addition to medical screenings that the offenders are, are put through. This applies to all new county jail admissions. Washable masks are now being produced by Correction Enterprise and distributed to staff, beginning with Central Prison, North Carolina Correctional Institution for Women, Wake Correctional Center, all here in Raleigh, where we saw an early spike in, in increases in the, with COVID in the community. Masks are on their way to all sites with positive cases now. Our correction enterprise team is, has made 3,500 reusable masks and we are producing at a rate of 6,000 per week. Distribution of those masks will continue uh, throughout the, the system. The masks are designed to decrease the chance of those working and housed in our facilities for accidental exposure to COVID-19. Yesterday, we also announced that masks are being made at a rate of 10,000 per week and will be distributed to all the offenders uh, throughout the uh, population of our system. Uh, we've put a number of signs uh, throughout the facilities to uh, go over cautions, concerns, and protections that staff and the offenders can take. Uh, but we've done many more things, too many to list at this time. Please visit our website at ncdps.gov under the Actions for Prisons section to, for a complete listing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Ishii. I think what you've heard just now is sort of an overview of what our, our work is ahead. First and foremost, stopping the spread of the virus, and that's where you come in, the staying at home, making sure you're washing your hands and playing your part. We are also working on our medical capacity and increasing that to make sure that your healthcare system is there when you need it. We're also making sure that we are focused on the economic toll that we know this crisis is taking and doing everything we can to address that, whether it's unemployment uh, uh, flexibilities or the order the governor uh, did earlier this week in terms of uh, making sure utilities don't get shut off during this time. And then lastly, to focus on some of our most vulnerable among us, whether it's in the correctional facilities or our long-term care facilities. A lot of work still to be done, um, and we're working night and day um, to make sure that we are as strong as we can together as a state. Thank you for doing your part in staying at home. With that, I'm going to turn it over to your questions. Hi, this is Chandler Morgan from WBTV. My question is for Commissioner Ishii. 
So where were these four inmates and four employees that tested positive for COVID-19 located? And also you said that these health screenings were implemented March 31st. That was just two days ago. We've been dealing with this for at least 14 days. Why now? Why not earlier? Sure, thank you. The, the cases uh, regarding offenders are at the following sites. Caledonia Correctional Institution, we have two at Noose Correctional Institution and one at Johnston Correctional Institution. The staff cases are associated with Central Prison here in Raleigh, Johnston Correctional Institution, and the Maury and Eastern Correctional Institutions, which are located in Greene County. Thank you for your question about screening. Uh, we've had a challenge locating the no-touch thermometers. Uh, we've had an order in for quite some time and, and due to national shortage, uh, we were just able to re receive those recently and they were dispatched to all the prison facilities uh, the same day that, that we received them. This is Sydney Bouchelle with WWAY. My question is for Secretary Cohen. Um, the CDC currently recommends that you, the only people wearing the mask should be those that are sick or the ones that are treating the sick. That question, or that recommendation is being reconsidered by health officials. So is North Carolina having that discussion as well? And should people of North Carolina be wearing cloth masks or any additional protection when we're out in public when we need to be? Thank you for the question about masks. Yes, that is the topic of conversation lately, but let me make sure folks understand that we still do not have the protective equipment we need to protect our healthcare workers and our other first responders. That is our first priority, to make sure that we can protect those who are treating COVID-19 patients. As you heard from Director Sprayberry, we're working incredibly hard to scour literally the earth to bring supplies here to North Carolina. And we, we just don't have them at this point, but we're working hard um, to make sure we do. So as far as masks are concerned, those are going to be prioritized for those who are working in our healthcare facilities and other first, first responders. Then as we look at our masks and could masks be a component of uh, slowing the spread of the virus, I think that is uh, the right conversation for us to be having once we have the supplies that we need. But I will say that it is not a replacement for some of the tried and true things that we can do right now, which is washing our hands. Remember that cloth masks and, and face masks are really protecting the world from the person wearing the mask not the other way around. So it doesn't protect you, the mask wearer, from catching COVID-19. But it can be an important component as we move forward here and we'll continue to understand as our supply chain uh, gets better and we do have the supplies we need, whether or not that becomes an important component. But right now, we're focused on our frontline healthcare workers. And remember, you can do those tried and true things in terms of washing your hands, uh, wiping down surfaces, and of course, staying home. Thanks for the question. Secretary Taylor, if you would clarify, when you say you're adding 350 people, how many people do you already have? And then if you could just kind of walk us through, you were going to add 50. Is the 350 inclusive of that? Is it inclusive of the private call center that has been added to the two regular call centers? I just want to drill down a little bit on how many people you have had and how many people you will have. Thank you very much. The Three weeks ago, uh, when we were taking 3,000 claims a week, uh, we had a total staff of 500 individuals with, uh, with employment security. Um, we are, uh, talked about in the last press conference the fact that we had uh, the authorization of, of hiring an additional 50 uh, that was expedited through the uh, 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 OSHR, the, uh, the State Human Resources Office. Uh, last weekend, uh, our managers uh, interviewed individuals via Zoom uh, on Saturday and I believe Sunday as well. We started adding uh, more employees this week, onboarding them 
and I believe we have more starting tomorrow. I don't know exactly how many we started uh, this week, uh, but I think it was in the 10 to 20 range. Uh, the 350 uh, that I referred to uh, does include uh, the private call center uh, that we pulled on board earlier this week. Uh, that is currently staffed at 50 employees. We anticipate adding that to a total staff of 200 uh, right now. We're also going to be utilizing, as I've, I stated before, but we've been having to work on the technology as we transition our uh, existing call center uh, onto the cloud, onto a cloud platform, which is allowing us to redirect those calls that are coming into our 800 number uh, to other locations, such as to the private call center, to the Division of Workforce Solutions, who's offered us 100 individuals and will continue to add to that, as well as individuals that may be working uh, on a, uh, a telework and are working from home, of which we've been, been working on to ensure social distancing within our facility so we uh, don't expose ourselves uh, and the staff that are working so hard uh, to any unnecessary uh, infection. Yes, uh, this is, um, I was also wanted to speak with Assistant Secretary Taylor. Uh, I guess talking about the call centers, I understand that they may be available at this point around the clock, if, if that's accurate or not. And because it seems like some people are actually getting the access of uh, talking to people in sort of off hours. And then I was talking to somebody this, earlier this morning with uh, North Carolina Works. And they were talking about that they're basically having in-person events as they can so they can collect information for people who are having trouble online or, or making phone calls. And they're turning it over um, to ESC officials. And I was wanting to get a sense for how quickly the, those ESC officials are able to take that information they're getting from NC Works and contacting people who are trying to file claims. Understand and and. If I missed part of that question, I think that was two parts, and I didn't hear the, really the first part because of some audio issues. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and address the second part uh, first. We have been working over the last week uh, with getting the technology and being able to direct uh, those phone calls from our call center directly into uh, the uh, NC Work Career Center staff that have been offered and, and identified as being available to assist us. The second part of that is, is making sure that, that those staff members have uh, the ability, the capability of be getting into our system in order to uh, provide the services as opposed to just answering questions for the public. I know that those centers uh, have been answering a lot of questions on behalf, and we, we certainly thank them for their effort on that. Uh, but with the magnitude of this, uh, of this crisis right now, uh, they are a group that we have certainly identified that we are partners with. They were certainly part, or, or the, were certainly part of the old Employment Security Commission, that we know can assist us. And what they'll be doing, uh, in in all hopes, is assisting those within their local communities. And may I have the first question again, please? around the clock now, or is it still essentially business hours? The center uh, is not opening around the clock. We are going to be extending uh, those hours, uh, particularly now that we have the, the private call center on board. Uh, we're going to be able to uh, uh, expand those hours. Uh, those calls, I think, are cutting off uh, possibly at 5 o'clock, but that means when we cut those calls off right now at 5 o'clock, uh, that there are probably two to three hundred people still in the queue. And our staff is staying there until 7 or 7.30 at night to ensure that those queues uh, are handled before they close up shop. What we would anticipate is those call center uh, hours and the, and the calls will be accepted uh, up until 8 o'clock at night, and we will certainly be running uh, on Saturday as well.
Hi, Dr. Cohen. Uh, the Mecklenburg County Health Director, Gibby Harris, was understandably emotional during a meeting of the legislature's health care working group this morning, saying that in her, in her own words, the local projections were scary and keeping her up at night. Um, can you talk about the concentration of cases in Mecklenburg County, which has more than a quarter of the state's entire positive number of cases? Um, are they simply ahead of, of the rest of the state in the curve, so to speak, or what's going on there? Well, I so appreciate uh, Gibby's hard work. The local health departments are truly on the front lines of this uh, crisis and have been working for many months to, to respond. As we know, our our urban areas in our state, simply where there are more people, there are going to be more cases. Often that corresponds to those urban areas having more ability to have hospital resources. Obviously, we're watching those numbers very closely. That's exactly why we are doing the efforts we are, right? It's exactly why we keep um, trying to drill home that we're all in this together, no matter what part of North Carolina you're in. We all have to slow the spread of this virus together. And that goes back to the staying at home, washing your hands, really only leaving your home to go grocery shopping, to get medicine, to get health care, um, if, you're, if you're in one of those essential businesses, and then, and then really being at home um, so that we can truly slow the spread of this. We, we're seeing what some of the incredibly hard impacts this virus is having in other cities around this country. We're working incredibly hard to not have that happen here, but we have to plan for that to happen. And so we are working also incredibly hard to make sure that our medical system is ramping up its capability to be able to handle whatever's coming our way. So a lot of work on all fronts to slow the spread of the virus, as well as to ramp up our medical capability. And I certainly, my heart goes out to all of our local leaders and our, our public health leaders in particular. I know how hard uh, this has been, and I, I, I share her strong emotions uh, that she shared this morning. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Ken Smith at WRL-TV. This message is for Commissioner Ishii. Um, how many staffers at, um, have been testing positive at Central Prison, and is that staffer uh, still in quarantine? What's his, his or her status? Uh, with regards to Central Prison, we've had one employee report uh, that they've been infected by the coronavirus. They are currently off work and at home under care of their physician. Hi, this question is for, um, I, this is Elizabeth Ann from the Citizen Times. Uh, this question is from uh, for Mike Sprayberry. Um, could you elaborate on the request to FEMA to house people in uh, hotels and dormitories and other buildings? Would FEMA reimburse the hotels and other buildings for um, those stays? Um, who would be responsible for getting those people food? Could you just speak to that a little bit more? Roger, and so um, thank you for that question. First of all, it's just a request at this time, and it has not been approved. But if it is approved, we would be allowed to uh, place folks into places like hotels and dormitories, and whatever the cost would be for eligible cost, the federal government would reimburse the state 75% uh, of that, and the state would pick up the 25% non-federal cost share. So. What this is, is this is planning, uh, and this is what we do for the different scenarios. And as we look towards the future, if we think that we are gonna, if we're gonna have a big um, uh, surge of patients that uh, need assistance or folks that need to be kept in a place that does not necessarily have to be a hospital or part of the healthcare system, this would be a good solution for us to keep people in isolation uh, while they get better. Thank you. Thank you. This is Andrea Blanford with ABC 11. This is a question for either Dr. Cohen or Director Sprayberry, perhaps both. Um, could you just tell us more about the medical before you start deploying these folks? Thanks. 
Thanks for the question. Yes, we are continuing to recruit volunteers, whether they're doctors or nurses or other kinds of clinician, respiratory therapists, as well as non-clinical um, folks. Um, we are planning to need volunteers um, and to deploy folks. What we're doing right now is that when someone ap applies through our volunteer process, they get vetted to ensure that they have the light the correct licensure, understand what, what area of focus they're able to work in. Um, and then we, if we need to deploy them, um, we certainly want to be con taking into consideration each of their personal health risks. I, I imagine that, that all of the folks around North Carolina that have been volunteering all want to help, um, which is fantastic, and we, but we also want to make sure that we're keeping them safe. We are seeing a high number of folks who are recently retired, um, and we're working through um, some logistics to make sure that their, their licensures can be maintained even though they are coming out of retirement, so we're working through those issues. And as far as when and where we would deploy it, that's the planning process that's going on right now in terms of how we are planning for medical uh, capacity around the state. Ideally, we'd want our volunteers to uh, help as close to home as possible, but we are also planning for the need to move them around the state to, in case there is a hot spot in a particular area where we need more capacity. That's the work going on right now with Director Sprayberry's team. Anything else to add? No, okay. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm wondering how many state employees are still going to work in their offices each day, and are there any plans to close any additional offices? Thanks for the question. So as the governor's order stated, we want folks to stay home, end of story. Um, I think that's what it takes to stop the spread of this virus. Um, so unless folks are going to the grocery store to get medical care, to the pharmacy, um, or work in one of the essential businesses like healthcare or to keep our utilities going or in the, our grocers, really, really want folks to be staying home. Um, we know that this is a huge change for folks. We're asking for a dramatic change in everyone's day. I know how hard this is, um, but we so are appreciative of everyone being in this together, right? This is us, we're looking out for our communities. Um, and, and doing our part here. So do your best to stay at home uh, unless you have one of those uh, uh, essential jobs like healthcare or our grocers or keeping our utilities running um, or you're just getting food for your family. The more we can do on the front end right now slows the spread of this virus. We don't wanna see happen what's happen happening in some other parts of, of the country. We're trying to prevent that on the front end and I think if we all work together, we know we can do that. So being that, that I want to leave it there with our last question. Um, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, wash your hands um, and we'll be back with you uh, tomorrow with the governor. Thank you.